I'm honored to be here today. This is, I think, my third time. I heard about an Episcopal clergy. I see several Episcopal clergy here today because I met them upstairs. And by the way, I'm not sure I'm talking to the press or the clergy today because there's so many clergy here today. But um, I heard about uh, this man that had just gotten out of seminary down here in Alexandria. And uh, this was his first church. And uh, the church was crowded and they were right on the front row. And his text was, Behold, I come unto you. And that's all he could think of. His mind went blank. And he said it three times. Behold, I come unto you. And then he'd stop and say it again. Behold, I come unto you. And this time the podium broke. <laughs> and he fell right in the lap of a lady on the front row. And he got up and he was so embarrassed. He was trying to apologize. And she said, Please don't apologize. You warned me three times. <laughs> And this is my third time to be at the press club, and I'm highly honored uh, to be here. For over 30 years, it's been my privilege to uh, meet uh, reporters and to know publishers and editors in various parts of the world. And I can say without reservation, and I hope it won't be considered flattery, to say that the American press is the best in the whole world. I don't know another press like this. And in all these years, it's very interesting to me I guess I've been interviewed hundreds of times by American reporters, and very rarely have I ever been misquoted. Sometimes my quote's been taken out of context, but uh, uh, very rarely have I been misquoted. And that's something that I don't get in other parts of the world. And this, I think, says something of the integrity of the American press. But um, I think that uh, all of us recognize that we're in the midst of an upheaval uh, in the world, and we're asking ourselves as you cover the news and as you try to interpret the news, what's it all about? And uh, to try to keep it all in perspective. And I think what we're really writing about and talking about today is the human condition, and that's what I would like to talk about. During the past uh, two years, I have traveled more than any other period of my life. I've been to Europe five times, I've been to Latin America, to Asia twice, all up and down Asia. I've just returned from Singapore and Japan and uh, uh, Africa and many of the islands of the sea. And I've been asking a question of many of these people. I've been saying, what is the future? What does the future hold? And I found a tremendous pessimism sweeping many of our leaders throughout the world. I'm not talking about press leaders now, I'm talking about political leaders, heads of state, and people like that. In private, maybe they will say something to me as a clergyman that they might not say to you for the record, but there's a tremendous pessimism. I was in Iran and I saw the Shah. I've been in Israel and I've been in G Egypt and I've talked to the leaders of those countries and I felt something of the trembling and the upheaval that is going on. One leader said to me, look at a map and see Vietnam, all the way down from Vietnam, across Thailand, Malaysia, Burma, India, Pakistan, all through the Middle East, Turkey, upheaval, difficulties, and then I thought of other parts of the world. All over the world, there seems to be a spirit of change and crisis. The word crisis means change. And all change and all crisis are not bad. Some of it's good. My wife and I flew down to Guatemala right after they'd had the earthquake because we have a, a fund to uh, help in emergency needs. And we went down about two days after the earthquake. Everything was devastated. I'd never seen such devastation. And of course, an earthquake like that comes from a fault line. And I thought about the fault lines in our world today. And... Uh, the social fault lines, the political fault lines. We could go to Iran, to Lebanon, to Rhodesia, to Cambodia, to Northern Ireland, to Chile, to Argentina. Uh, anywhere you turn today, there are fault lines that we find in our world. In fact, um, there is no meeting of the world. There's no section of the world that is immune to political and economic upheaval. Jeremiah the prophet speaks of the time when people will say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
Now, I know that the issues are very complex, and like most of you, I don't have all the answers. But I believe that the continuing rampant escalation of arms in our world is not merely a political issue, it's a moral issue. Several months ago, I visited the concentration camp complex at Auschwitz, where millions of Jews and other peoples were callously murdered by the Nazis. And I, my wife and I knelt as we laid a wreath and we prayed. And when I got up, there were a number of television people there, and I made a speech, and it was one of the few times in my life that I was overcome with emotion by what I'd seen and felt, and then I thought of the whole world. We now have the weapons to make the whole world an Auschwitz before the end of this century or even before the end of the next decade. And that is why I pray for the leaders of the world. That's why I pray especially for all of those that are involved in the disarmament talks. While I'm not for unilateral disarmament, I am for disarmament. As a Christian, I'm committed not only for peace, but to work for peace. And this is one of the several reasons that I have begun accepting invitations to Eastern countries to contribute a better understanding and a better relations with those that hold different ideologies. We can't afford another war, a nuclear war, because there'll only be losers. There are other fault lines, the economic fault line that is moving toward a crisis of such proportions that it staggers the imagination. Physical hunger and starvation stalk many parts of the world, and the cries of these people are getting louder and louder and louder. And in my judgment, we are going to voluntarily change our lifestyles in the Western world, especially in America, and listen to their cry, or we're going to be forced to it. The world has become a neighborhood and will no longer tolerate the extreme rich and the extreme poor. And you're going to hear the tramp, 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 tramp of their feet and the cries of these people in other parts of the world. There's the social fault line with such things in our own society as the mindless hedonistic materialism of our culture. I was interested to note that the final issue of New Times magazine a few days ago carried an article on decadence. America shrugged. It said there's something in the air, a sense of slippage, the perfume of decay. Life is slick and bright and noisy, but there's a softness here, a crumbling behind the gloss. After two centuries, we have reached a consensus of indifference, they said, end quote. However, there's a fault line or a crisis that is far greater than any we read in our newspapers, and it's far greater than any that I've mentioned. Our greatest enemy is not inflation, it's not crime, it's not communism, but it's the moral and spiritual dilemma that faces all of us. The Bible asks the same question that we're asking today. What causes all this upheaval? What causes crime? What causes wars? And what causes fightings among you? In the book of James. Then the Bible gives us the answer. Is it not your passions that are at war inside? You desire and do not have, you kill and you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. The war starts in our hearts. It's in our families. It's in our neighborhoods. And projected on a world scale, it becomes a world war. The spiritual problem of humanity is the great linkage between the other problems we face. But unfortunately, man has never become capable of obeying these moral laws. The moral disease is in every human heart. At the heart of this disease is rebellion against the Creator and the moral law that's been built into the fabric of the universe. As a Christian, I also believe that there is another dimension. It's called in the Bible the mystery of iniquity. The Bible tells us that there are forces of evil at work in this world which we must take seriously. I do not see how something like Jonestown can be explained apart from the demonic. I do not see how some of the horrors of some of the political demagogues of this century can be explained apart from the demonic. The Bible says, for our fight is not against any physical enemy, I'm quoting the scripture now, it is against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. 
A month ago, I was in London, and I picked up a, a magazine that uh, says, what's going on in London? And I counted the motion pictures dealing with the devil or with the demonic. There were 19 motion pictures being shown in London in addition to the horror pictures and the pornographic pictures. The films Star Wars and Superman are very interesting to me. Both have been tremendously successful at the box office and both play on the theme of evil versus good. And what's interesting and encouraging to me is that the young people and the audiences react by booing evil and applauding good. Both these films also have spiritual implications in both as the Messiah figure. People have been looking to presidents and Congress and government to bail them out, constantly looking for a Messiah with all the answers, all the ideal programs. But the same problems keep cropping up that cropped up a thousand years ago. Every time we have a problem, we're referred to the creation of a new committee or a new task force or a new blue ribbon pa panel as a typical solution. I'm not naive. I know that even if everyone turned to God in the whole world, there would still be problems. We are still sinners even when we're born again spiritually. But I also knew this, that any solution to the problems we face that neglects the spiritual side of man is no solution at all, can only be temporary. What of the future? There are signs that a reaction is setting into the empty materialistic world which we've built. Everywhere I go, I meet people who have turned to God and experienced vital spiritual renewal, which in turn is beginning to touch the issues we face in society. I talked to one high-level government official in Eastern Europe, a socialist leader, who said that any system of government which does not acknowledge the spiritual side of man's nature cannot meet the needs of the whole person. I believe there are three things that we can do. First, we must realize that a spiritual vacuum exists. Secondly, we must restore spiritual and moral values to our society. And whether we're talking about government, business, labor, family, education, or any other aspect of society, we need to restore the concept of right and wrong. And my challenge to the press of America would be, let's bring these fundamental values to light again. You can do it. Let's work for the reversal of the runaway trend toward moral degeneracy that has destroyed so many nations in the past. Let's seek an emphasis on the positive virtues and let's communicate the fact that fundamental moral values have the same power to heal the minds, hearts, and souls of people as they've always had. I think you would be surprised at the positive reaction you would get throughout the country. As I travel in America, my reading is that the great masses are at the throwing up point with sick humor and sick hunt conduct and sick attitudes of all kinds. Millions are craving something wholesome and meaningful and basic to which they can turn and which they can rely. Thirdly, we must recommit our lives individually to God and that includes you. Society will not be changed in any lasting sense till somehow we've calmed down the war within our own hearts. As a Christian, of course, I believe that is why Jesus Christ came. He did not come simply to give us an example or to give us some wonderful teachings, which he did, but he came for a more important reason. He came to bring peace, love, and joy, and to make it possible, and to restore us to a right relationship with God and to each other. And that's what Good Friday and Easter is all about in Christmas. As Christians, we believe that when Christ died on the cross, he made it possible not only for man to be reconciled with God, but to be reconciled with his fellow man. On the last day of his life, Pope Jean Paul I spoke to the Filipino bishops, and he made a very interesting statement. He said, the highest priority, or one of the highest priorities of our church will be the evangelization of those that have already been baptized. Suppose every person that claims to be religious in America, Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, were living it. What a change there would be. In other words, he called for spiritual renewal within those that call themselves religious. The new Pope, Pope John Paul II, at his installation, if you saw it, he brought an evangelistic address in which he called upon the people in five languages to renew their commitment to Christ. 
I have 14 grandchildren and another one on the way. And I think about those grandchildren, and it's the cry of our world, give me tomorrow. There will only be an American tomorrow if we turn to God in time and have a great spiritual and moral renewal that sweeps this country from Milwaukee to Houston and from coast to coast. Thank you very much.